was that was just a brief introduction, wasn't it? I was just going to say, since 2012, uh, we've been involved with Person Cross Services Trust in this uh, project. Um, when I was trying to pull this talk together, I realised actually how much we've done over those five years. It's amazing. We've just been up there generally two or three weeks a year. And the amount of information we found about a relatively little known subject has been fantastic. Um, I'll whiz through and try and give you a bit of a, a bit of background, a bit of summary of what we've done so far, and then a kind of uh, update on what we, we did this year. Um, it's been funded by a, a variety of people through years, but this year uh, it's primarily been funded by Perth and Ross Heritage Trust, Historic Environment Scotland, and the Ganachie Trust. I'm sure some of you have heard this story before, but the, the idea for this project all came about really off the back of a couple of things. One being the Royal Commission survey in, at the end of the 1980s, published in the early 90s. Uh, their survey of northeastern Perth, uh, a fantastic survey that still, you know, forms the basis of lots of research today. Uh, they recorded a huge variety of sites. Uh, a huge amount of post-medieval farm sites, as you would expect. I think this is the site of Easter Bleaton here. Prehistoric sites. This is uh, these are hut circles, Dunrullian hut circles. Really distinctive double walls, huge structures uh, spread throughout the landscape. Multi-phase. Landscapes, you have post medieval settlement. I don't know if you can look out too well on this one, but roughly in the centre of the picture, there's a kind of long, probably post medieval farmstead. You'll see circular structures in there representing prehistoric remains, plough, rig, and furrow cultivation spread around. So it's a kind of, you know, layers of landscape history on top of each other. One of the, the key things in terms of uh, our project was when we were surveying this area. There was one type of site that kind of popped out as being slightly unusual, and these were uh, rectangular longhouses, um, very, very ephemeral. Um, a couple of examples here you should hopefully be able to see. Uh, picked out well in aerial photograph, but might not be so obvious when you're on the ground, but as they were going through doing the survey, they began to see kind of patterns of these, these structures were in quite a few locations. That's an example uh, of one in the snow. Um, you take the snow away from that and it would be incredibly difficult to see. Uh, because of this, that was what led them to suggest that these structures were made of turf primarily. So over time, de decomposition, weathering, effectively, effectively spreads out and you're, not, you're left with not a lot. Low sunlight, snow often helps to kind of identify these structures. There's a few examples I put in here about uh, of uh, these structures that the Royal Commission recorded. You'll see from some of them that there's a few characteristics that are spread through the different sites. Um, it seems to be a kind of continuous thing. One is they they are they've got rounded ends. Uh, they're not kind of regular like you you would expect from sort of later structures. They quite often have attached enclosures either to one end or smaller ones to the front. Quite often have sunken areas. You'll see the two over on the right hand side there have, have kind of sunken interiors in part of the structure. Um, stone elements to them, but primarily defined by turf banks. So off the back of that survey that the Commission did and it was published in the 90s, they, they, they had this distinct class of, of structure that was present in the Perthshire uplands. They had the pre-sort remains, they had the post-medieval remains, so kind of logically they suggested that they were medieval, early medieval in date, because uh, that was the gap in, in the archaeological evidence. That led to a team from Glasgow University in uh, the early and mid 90s uh, excavated uh, some of the sites that the Royal Commission recorded at Picarnock, um, just off Strathardo. Um, that was key in terms of our uh, starting off our understanding about these structures because it showed that they were primarily made of turf. They had stone foundations, as you may be able to see in some of these photographs. They varied, there were very, some very long buildings, 20 to 30 metres long, some much smaller, 10 to 20 metres long. 
that one of the the key things were the radiocarbon dates that we got from uh, one of the hearths, which showed that these were primarily in use from the kind of eighth to ninth centuries AD. Um, reused uh, slightly later in the 11th and 12th centuries, but it kind of it, it was the first kind of proof that the Royal Commission's kind of assumption that these were from the, the early medieval period were correct in at least some instances. This is a kind of this is a distribution map just to give you an idea of where the Royal Commission recorded these types of structures. You can see Glenshee on the right hand side there, Shrothardle in the middle, and the Tay in the west. Um, the concentration is quite clearly to the east of the Tay, uh, up the glens and off the side glens of Strathardle and Glenshee. A few outliers to the west of the Tay, but pretty much concentrated to the east. So, since the Glasgow University investigations in the, the early and mid-90s, nothing had really happened uh, in these structures. There hadn't been any more survey in northeastern Perth because obviously the Commission survey was pretty thorough. There hadn't been any excavations that really targeted these on a large scale. So that was one of the main reasons that uh, led Perth and Ross Heritage Trust to develop a project um, looking at these structures uh, and involving uh, the local community and volunteers from wider afield. So that was a photograph of Glen Shee there, an aerial photograph that you, hopefully you can make out uh, roughly where our site at Lair is. Um, kind of in the northern half of Glen Shee, heading towards the spittle of Glen Shee, which is just uh, beneath that A93 in the if you can't make it out. And that's the site itself. That's in, in the background there's Mount Blair in the top left. That's Glen Shee running up and down the, across the middle of the photograph. And you can probably just about make out the trenches and the tent and in the bottom there. That's uh, the site we've focused on um, in terms of excavations over the past five years. We started off in, by doing some more detailed topographic survey just to give us a bit more idea of what was going on. Despite the Commission survey being very, very thorough, um, but we did, the more time we spent up there, we realised there were other things that they might have kind of missed just because they were so ephemeral. Being up there at different times of the year helps identify these structures. So this, I don't want to dwell too much in all the stuff, but the, in the top left there is the site that we will, I'll talk a little bit more about in terms of excavation. Some of the other sites down to the bottom right-hand side, Glen Shee is effectively at the right of that plan. You, you have post-medieval remains, you have retting ponds down at the, the right-hand side there, a gully leading from a burn down to the retting ponds. You have a whole series of small longhouses, um, which we've kind of nibbled into in terms of excavation over the years. Uh, but I don't have time to talk about that a huge amount. I'm going to concentrate on the stuff up in the top left there. That was really just to give you an idea. In, in a relatively small area at Lair, uh, there's a huge, there's a, a hugely varied amount of archaeological range you can see in the surface. So the site that we concentrated in terms of the excavations, um, the aerial photograph there taken by the Royal Commission, you don't see a huge amount, but we have a prehistoric ring cairn there, which you can maybe make out. We have two uh, Iron Age, Bronze Age roundhouses down on a kind of platform on the, the right hand side there. We have three of uh, the Pitkarmic type longhouses, uh, these kind of supposed early medieval longhouses there, and we have another two uh, end on end longhouses extending off uh, one side of the ring cairn there. This is uh, gives you a little bit more clarity. This comes from the Royal Commission's drawing, so you can see in the right hand side there, on the bottom right hand side, there are three. Uh, parallel longhouses with a kind of round enclosure off the kind of southwestern side. Two end on end longhouses coming off the northwestern side of the ring cairn, and the two prehistoric roundhouses up in north there. We supplemented that with a bit more survey, kind of just to pick out some of the stonework and suggest where the banks and things of these structures are a little bit more ephemeral. Um, and it was also supplemented by some geophysics by Peter Morris, which is in the, geophysics in these kind of upland landscapes is notoriously difficult because of the different 
uh, properties of the rock um, can interfere, but he had really good results. And you can see, you know, he's picking out the stone of the roundhouses, some kind of anomalies uh, in the centre of the cairn, and also in and around the longhouses. So, questions we had. How were these longhouses constructed? The only other excavated example was a one in Pitcarmick in the early 90s. How old were they? Again, the Royal Commission recorded hundreds of these structures. There's only been one excavated example that suggested they were early historic, but saying from that, saying all of them are, is maybe pushing it a little bit. So, how old were the ones that lay? Um, were these different structures used at the same time, or you know, did they represent different phases? And what were they used for? So I'll give you a bit of a summary of because the structures we've focused the excavations on over the years are the two end-on-end -end ones just off the ring here and the three slightly more complex ones to the east of those. Um, I'll give you a bit of a summary of what we found with those. So the little structure uh, next to the cairn, um, I don't know if you think you should be able to make it there. The, that's a plan of the excavation trench and a photograph representing the, the same thing. You can see from the photograph and the plan that the, the concentrations of stones seem to be around either end. Uh, at the western end there, there was quite a, a large stone foundation on top of which had been built a kind of low turf wall. At the eastern end, again, there was a bit of a stone foundation, but interestingly there, the large stones you can see at the eastern end of the structure had actually been rolled directly off the prehistoric ring cairn. So at the very bottom right hand side of the photograph there, that's the trench has just nibbled into the, the prehistoric ring cairn. The big boulders you can see at the end of the building have been rolled off this cairn, which is kind of unusual in terms of archaeology because you're seeing a precise moment where the people that were building the longhouse, or after the longhouse had been built, had decided for whatever reason to roll these stones off the rink here onto the end of the turf longhouse. The sides of the longhouse, not a lot of stone at all. You can roughly make out the shape of the structure from the odd stone here or there, but it certainly doesn't look like it, the, these stones originated from any real structural element. Were they just laying some stones around the outside to make the, the, the building look nice? Were they laying them to define where they were going to build the turf walls? There's lots of questions there. In terms of internal features, we didn't excavate it all down to the natural subsoil, but we did come across a very kind of poorly constructed hearth, which is the kind of orange bit in there. You can probably see the darker bit in the photograph. Um, I say poorly as it wasn't a really nice stone-defined hearth. It was just a kind of spread of burning. Um, at, the end, at the western end, there were a whole series of post holes and also a linear gully that sat underneath this stone foundation. In contrast, slightly, this is the longer building that, that sat end on end with that smaller structure. There, there was hardly any evidence of stone at all. Um, what we've got here is at the top of the picture is, will be the end of the smaller structure with the cairn beyond that. So you're looking at the, kind of, the, the end of the, the, that longhouse that joins onto the smaller building, if that makes sense. Where the big pit is at the end, uh, very central, right at the end, could it be the remains of a kind of post setting for a crook frame or something like that? But in terms of archaeology in this build, or visual arts, I'd, 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 I'd forgotten that was there, that kind of shows you roughly where the edge of the end of the longhouse is. In terms of visual archaeology, again, it's quite ephemeral remains you're looking at, and the top left there is potentially the entrance. Visible is nothing more than a kind of spread of gravel. The pit itself, um, not too distinct. Um, one of the nicer things in this building is we're getting the evidence of possible in situ turf banks in terms of the darker stony area uh, you can see in the photo on the right there. But all in all, uh, for such a big building, not a huge amount of really visible archaeology. And, uh, Despite it not being that exciting to look at, it was actually really interesting because it kind of suggests at this lower end of the building that the whole thing was, was, was constructed from organic material that disappears over time. So in archaeological terms, you're looking for, for effectively invisible remains. 
Uh, that's just a quick photo showing you the kind of negative features. So there were clearly post holes there. There's been a wooden element. Um, ultimately, the wood would probably be quite valued in terms of nice crux. So uh, they would form the likely form the frame of the building, and the rest of them would have been made. The rest of the building would be constructed by turf. This is uh, one of the key things, that's a, a reconstruction drawing we have, just showing slightly, you know, one, one thing that is unknown about these features is the roof. Um, we can kind of look at uh, more recent examples in this country and abroad, but this is a reconstruction of those, those buildings I was talking about there. So you have the cairn on the right hand side, uh, you have a smaller building there, turf walls, one of the things I'll mention a little bit more at the end of the talk, what was the roof made of? Was it turf? Could it have been a broom thatch? Could it have been a combination? And the building on the left there is that much longer one I mentioned, which hardly had any uh, stone remains at all. Very, very difficult to pick out. Was it just completely constructed by turf? I wanted to put that picture up there purely because one of the key features of the longer building was the kind of western half actually sat on a slope. So you had a long house that was relatively level and then that's the, the one half of it was on quite a steep slope. They could easily have built it on the level if they wanted to, so that slope must have been key, one of the key reasons for putting the building there. Was it because animals were in there? You know, did that help with the drainage? Um, despite the archaeology itself not being too visible in these buildings, the finds we got from it were, were quite a surprise really. Uh, that's some x-rays of, I think we've, maybe got, we've got three or four knives in total, that's an x-ray of two knives on the right hand side there of the x-rays, and also two buckles. Um, quite surprisingly as well, at the end of the, the, the crook pit that I showed you there, uh, at the end of the longer, long, uh, longer longhouse, uh, when we processed the soil samples from there we found these minuscule green glass beads um, which are down at the bottom right. And you, I mean, they're, they're, they're so small, you know, that scale is at one centimetre, uh, so they're, you know, they're ju just over half a, cent um, ha half a centimetre, maybe 7.5 millimetres in total, uh, the size of them. So they're, they're tiny. Really interesting. Hugh Campbell at Glasgow University had a look at these, and uh, he was really interested in them. He could only think of one other example of beads that are constructed like this, kind of joined together in a, a very particular way. Uh, only one other example in Scotland. There's a possibility he thinks it could have been locally made, but he thinks more likely they've come from the continent or some kind of have some kind of Anglo-Saxon origins. So whether they, you know, they've made their way up to Lear Glenshee. So if if they have come from the continent or the Anglo-Saxon kind of settlements further south, that gives you a, it's quite key because it shows us that you know there were links, there were trade links potentially. In terms of radiocarbon dates, um, just from these two structures, we had to get quite a few. Um, one of the difficulties we had was finding features of, of a really secure context, um, but we managed to get quite a few, a few dates and broadly the main, the main bulk of the dates work in the 7th and 9th century, so that's really good. A few slightly later and slightly earlier, but the bulk of them were 7th and 9th centuries, so we're pretty sure that's when those buildings were occupied. Um, that was just to show you, that was the, the kind of initial two or three years we spent on those two buildings. The last two years, 2015 and, and this year, we've looked at the slightly more complex building in the, to the east there. Um, just that's a, uh, Eddie Martin took these fantastic aerial photographs of the site. Initially in 2015 we dug big evaluation trenches across the complex of buildings just to see what was going on. Just to give you an idea, that's the kind of layout of the three longhouses and the porch in the front. Uh, one of the interesting things uh, with these buildings was that archaeology was much more visible. Um, here you have a section across one of the longhouses, um, roughly, in the, roughly in the middle, and what had happened, or what we think has happened, is they've actually hollowed out the floor. So that kind of corresponds, if you remember, to those sunken areas that the Royal Commission had kind of picked up in their surveys. They then infilled it with stone to create this kind of raised stone floor. So again, was this part, was this suggesting that part of the building had to have good drainage? Was that maybe where they kept animals? But also, once we took that stone away, 
the war post ev evidence for postals beneath the stones. You can see one of them getting excavated there. It's just that's quite a good photo because it kind of shows the reasonable depth. If the floor, you imagine the floor surface would be at the top of the stones there, they'd actually hollowed it out a good kind of 30, 40 centimetres before putting the stones in. One of the star finds from uh, 2015, right up at the end of one of the long houses was a, a kind of incised spindle whorl. Um, again, something we'd never really come across at all uh, at Lair before. It's the, the previous finds have been very much knives, buckles, um, apart from the beads. This uh, great at the moment, it's been looked at by Catherine Forsyth and one of our PhD students at Glasgow University because much as it being looking like a kind of jumble of scratches here and there, it looks like um, there could be some, some images, possibly even some writing in there. Uh, we don't want to say too much at the moment because it is all conjecture, but I'm sure you can make out. The more you look at it, the more you start making out. There could be representations of animals, you see on the right-hand side, the kind of four legs. There's possibly some organ writing in there, really rough organ writing, but uh, all to be confirmed. Uh, <clears throat> one of the key features of this set of long houses was the enclosure at the front. Uh, what was it for? Why would you have a little enclosure in the front of one of your turf buildings? In 2015, we found a central pit, which was incredibly interesting because it wasn't just a, a kind of pit. It was a pit that had been capped by turf at some point. You see the kind of black lines in the section there um, when it had gone out of use. It had then sunk in, filled up a little bit, and been capped by turf again. So that threw up a whole load of questions as to what was going on uh, with the pit. That's just that arrow there shows you where the pit was, right bang in the middle of the circular enclosure. From 2015, the radiocarbon dates we got from uh, three features, again, 7th to 9th century, um, from pretty secure context, so that was good. One slightly later date, but it kind of overlaps with the 7th to 9th century, so again, it suggests that these buildings were in use around about the same time as the other ones. This year, because of the spindle whorl and the nice pit we found in the enclosure, we dug two big trenches over that end of the building there, trying to uncover the whole of the interior. Uh, again, much more vis visible archaeology uncovered. You see in the bottom left there uh, and the top right, you can make out a, a central hearth, um, stone lined, uh, completely different from the hearth we had in the other buildings. And the top left there, you get an idea about the slope of the building was constructed on, with the raised stone floor potentially at the kind of bottom end there. Um, so again, these all hint at what, what the building was used for. Finds from this year, uh, we had a really nice iron hook from right next to the hearth, we had a really nice iron spike from within the hearth. And in terms of the circular enclosure, not just one pit in the middle, but a whole series of pits. I think we had maybe three or four uh, pits of a similar size, none with the nice tough capping of that central one, but all of a kind of similar size. So something, you know, the, the, yeah, that circular enclosure was being used for something relatively consistent. Also from in that enclosure, uh, Great stone finds are really small. It's lovely when you see it up close. It's a kind of portable whetstone, and um, that ties in quite nicely with the iron knives we were finding in the other building, and also part of a much bigger circular grinding stone, sharpening stone. Uh, these were all found uh, in the floor of that circular enclosure. Uh, that's a really quick summary of the structures that we've excavated so far. Uh, similar to what Davy was saying earlier on, Richard Tipping from Glasgow, uh, from Stirling University has <laughs> taken a pollen core, I want to mention this because it is quite important, uh, taken a pollen core from about 200 metres away from the sites we've been excavating. And it, He's managed to uh, identify a kind of phase in the core he took that correlates roughly to the kind of seventh to ninth centuries that we were looking at. And uh, up until that time, uh, there was only really evidence in his pollen core for grazing, you know, there were grass pollens, that kind of stuff. But round about the kind of early seventh century, um, suddenly uh, barley, oats, and rye uh, appeared in his. Uh, co uh, peat column, along with herbs that uh, are characteristically associated with arable fields. Um, so that's amazing in terms of the story of that landscape, because he's 
finding evidence of agriculture suddenly appearing that's tying in with the archaeological evidence we're finding uh, for the date of the use of these houses. So it was clear they were growing crops in that area at that time. Uh, he seems to th he suggests that the absence of that evidence up until then was because at, at around about that time there was a kind of climatic anomaly and the, uh, it, there was a lot more precipitation which apparently allowed uh, cultivation at slightly higher levels. Um, this cultivation appeared to last for about 400 years until it ceased around about 1000 AD um, and it goes back to grassland, primarily grassland, so still grazing but not cultivation. Um, just going back really quickly, because I know I'm going to run out of time, back to our original questions. What were these constructed of? Turf. Um, we suspect they were relatively low-lying walls. We pick up the top right there, photograph shows kind of remains of turf lenses in the, in the top of the soil. That's the kind of stuff we're picking up. The photograph at the bottom you probably can't make out, but it shows in situ turf wall. There's maybe three or four layers of turf. It's an earthy core, only about a metre wide, so we're actually picking up in situ wall, it suggests they're quite low. Um, and this is a, a ba us having a bash at reconstructing one up at the left hand side there. Um, both Davy and myself have been over in Iceland, they've got a great tough building tradition. This is just to give you an idea of, of a purely tough constructed roof and wall, wall building, it would have wooden supports on the inside. We don't think our walls are nearly as high as that, but it gives you an idea of what, what these things might, might look like, particularly the lower layers, a kind of combination of turf and stone. Um, again, that just, these are examples of, of what, our, what we think our sites were like. Some of these sections that we've, we've got put together show different ways that they might have been constructed. Um, were the crooks sitting in the ground? Were they sitting within the wall? So, how old were they? Um, the dates we've got for both those features, we can be pretty confident they were in use from the 7th to 9th centuries, possibly earlier, possibly later, but that was a key, key thing. Uh, we don't have enough resolution yet to know whether they were in use at the same time or not. Um, we're going to work with the radiocarbon lab at East Kilbride to try and refine that a little bit. Um, what were they in use for? As I've kind of summarised, archaeology in both the eastern and western kind of groups of longhouses were quite different. So were one of were the more complex ones, the one with the enclosure, was that maybe where they were living? Um, were the ones that were the ones off the at the bottom there off the cairn, was that maybe more of a barn type structure? Was that where they were keeping some of the animals? That's where we're kind of headed at the moment. Uh, a really quick mention to the variety uh, levels of kind of education we've used the the uh, project to get primary school kids involved, secondary school kids, students from Aberdeen, Glasgow, Edinburgh universities and also the kind of more local area. Uh, we've had some fantastic outreach events that some of you were probably at, the event we had at Blair Gowrie a year or so ago and we've produced some leaflets in the archaeology of the area. I have to give a nod obviously to the fantastic volunteers that have been involved, particularly at the start when they were pretty much excavating just brown soil. Um, and we'll, as the project progresses, you can always get updates on all the specialist reports and the DSRs on the website.